the government is closed, the spy museum is not. So, okay. Welcome to the International Spy Museum, and thank you so much for coming out this evening. I'm Peter Ernest, the executive director of the museum, and I'm very pleased uh, to introduce Craig Floyd, whom I've now known for a number of years, who keeps trying to build a competitor museum. <laughs> and although I've put obstacles in his way, progress continues, and I'm sure it will go very well. We look forward to his joining and that museum joining us here in this city of museums. As you know, he's chairman and chief executive officer of the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund. And we're very, very pleased to welcome him and all of you to the International Spy Museum this evening. All right, so have a great evening. Enjoy. Thank you. Let me welcome everyone here tonight. Uh, this is our eighth in a series of events that we call Witness to History. Gives us a very important opportunity to get a firsthand glimpse of the major moments in law enforcement history from those who actually participated in those events. And tonight we take a look into what the US Department of Justice has called, quote, the possibly the worst intelligence disaster in US history. For 22 years, from 1979 till 2001, Robert Hansen, an FBI special agent, spied for Soviet and Russian intelligence services against the United States. Tonight, we will examine this infamous case with the FBI official who was at the center of the investigation that led to Hansen's arrest, and with the author who wrote the definitive book about Hansen and the damage he did to America. We will look at what motivated an FBI agent and devoted family man to spy on his own country, how he was able to get away without being detected for more than 20 years, how he was ultimately discovered, and what changes were put into place to prevent such an intelligence catastrophe from ever occurring again. I want to begin by thanking the sponsor of our Witness to History series, and that would be the Target Corporation. Mahogany Eller and Paul McCabe are representing Target with us here tonight. Thank you both for uh, what you've done for us tonight and through this series. And certainly to our host this evening, uh, clearly the International Spy Museum has become uh, the premier or certainly a premier museum and institution here in our nation's capital and around this nation. And I want to thank uh, Peter Ernest, uh, their executive director, and the Spy Museum for uh, hosting this event and partnering with us. Uh, I hope this is one of many opportunities we'll have to partner together. And I also want to acknowledge and thank all of you for coming here tonight. This is our largest crowd we've ever had in this series of eight Witness to History events, and I think it says a lot about uh, the interest uh, uh, about this case, as well as uh, our partners here with the Spy Museum bringing some of their friends uh, and supporters here along with our own. So uh, thank you all for joining us. And I also want to acknowledge and thank C-SPAN uh, for filming tonight's event as they have many times before so that it can be shared with a nationwide audience. And uh, we'll make sure to get you that schedule of airings uh, after tonight's event. For those of you who might be unfamiliar with our work, uh, the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund was formed in 1984 to honor the service and sacrifice of America's peace officers. We dedicated a national monument honoring law enforcement in 1991. That memorial sits proudly in Judiciary Square just a couple blocks from here. And we're now building a national museum in their honor, set to open in the spring of 2016 right across the street from the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial in the 400 block of E and F streets. The Witness to History program is being operated under the auspices of the National Law Enforcement Museum. So now let me introduce our esteemed panelists for the evening. Uh, first, I'm gonna start with uh, FBI Special Agent Michael Rochford, retired. Uh, he comes from a long line of law enforcement professionals from Chicago. Uh, including a father who was a Chicago police officer. He began as a special agent with the FBI in the mid-1980s. He rose to become the unit chief at the FBI for Russian espionage 
and in March of 2002 became the senior level executive section chief for all of the espionage cases for the Bureau. He worked on many infamous spy cases including Audric Ames, Earl Pitts, another FBI agent who turned spy, and Robert Hansen. Mr. Rochford retired from the FBI in 2004 and we're very honored uh, and pleased to have him here with us tonight to share his story. And David Wise, uh, renowned author, in 1992 he wrote the book Spy, I have a copy of it here and there will be copies available on the tables outside the doors here for sale for those that might want to uh, get a copy after you hear this story, I think uh, it'll pique your interest and this book uh, really tells the whole story. We'll only be able to touch upon some of the highlights here tonight. Uh, it's called Spy, the inside story of how the FBI's Robert Hansen betrayed America. And he's known as the nation's leading espionage writer. Uh, he's written a total of 14 books, most of them about America's intelligence and espionage agencies. His latest book is Tiger Trap, America's Secret Spy War with China and it was one of Publishers Weekly top 10 political books of the spring of 2011. I thank other uh, distinguished guests that are here in the audience with us, too many to mention, but uh, certainly many law enforcement agency heads and, and great supporters of the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund. So let me start with an opening question for both of our panelists, if I might, and I'm gonna start with you, Mike, if you would. Um, let's put this case in some perspective, the Robert Hansen spy case. How much damage was done by Robert Hansen, the spy? Um, so can you hear me? Do I need to? Yeah, okay. please use the microphone for our uh, C-SPAN. So the, um, let me tell you, the assessment of the National Counterintelligence Executive in 2004 when I retired from the FBI relative to this case, their assessment was that he was the fourth most damaging spy in the history of the United States um, because largely of the technical losses that he was responsible for. Uh, cumulatively, if you had to reproduce some of these things, might be uh, somewhere around $20 billion to have to replace these things. Uh, lost of three lives and uh, multiple assets having been arrested. And second source predication to the KGB for much of what Ames had reported. National Counterintelligence Executive assessed Ames as having been the fifth worst spy in the history of the United States. Rosenberg's being number one, uh, Walker two, and uh, I honestly can't remember the, the third. I guess I'm getting old and feeble. Uh, but um, Conrad, that's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Very good. So I don't know how you would assess Manning or Snowden when you throw them in that mix, because both of those have to be looked at. Uh, that's what it was in 2004. Appreciate that, David. Uh, your, your thoughts? Well, uh, I can't put uh, Robert Hansen in Please use the microphone if you would. I'm sorry. I can't put a ranking on. Uh, on how bad he was, but he was bad, and uh, the damage he did was considerable because he passed hundreds of documents, secret documents to the Russians, um, and uh, he did so over a long period of time. And in addition, he, he did betray uh, three people, two of whom were executed. Now, they were also betrayed by Aldrich James, so it's impossible to know who was responsible for the execution of uh, Motorin and Martina, whom the FBI like to call M&M. &M. Um, but uh, they can both take credit for that, I guess. Uh, in terms of uh, people executed or imprisoned, I would think that uh, Ames had a, had a higher number. There were 10 that he betrayed who are no longer living, and many many others who, who went to prison. Uh, in the case of Hansen, as uh, Mike Rochford has pointed out, there were technical uh, uh, secrets that he gave away that uh, the Russians were very happy to have and they're very important. And the, the biggest, of course, was the um, secret tunnel under the Russian, Soviet, and then Russian embassy 
on Wisconsin Avenue in Washington, which was uh, built by the FBI, operated by the NSA, and uh, was a, you know, a, an incredible project. Um, I, uh, I, I circled that building many times looking for where the tunnel could have started, and uh, because no one would tell me. And uh, I, I think I know the house where it began. But uh, an, F an FBI uh, uh, official whom I have, for whom I have great respect, John Lewis, now retired, um, did tell me a funny uh, episode. He said that we had to consider what we were going to do after the tunnel was betrayed and discovered. Uh, didn't we have to uh, somehow close it down and the house might eventually be bought by somebody else and they decided they'd have to cement the entrance to the tunnel because otherwise you might be sitting down to dinner and suddenly three beefy Russians come up the <laughs> stairs, is the chair, you know, and uh, that wouldn't do at all. So they did block the entrance to the tunnel and I think I know the house but I don't really know for sure. Um, and uh, I, I did circle the building several times and also on foot trying to figure it out. Um, where the tunnel began. And I, I've written in, in the book about how they got rid of the dirt, which is, of course, a huge, a huge problem. How do you get rid of that amount of dirt when you excavate secretly under a building? Um, so the technical secrets that he gave away were very important. Um, and the, the fact is that this went on for so long, and he, he had access to the budget. He had access to the technical stuff. Some of the documents he gave away dealt with uh, our estimate of the uh, Soviet nuclear capacity. I mean, this was serious stuff that he was giving away and, uh, and material that I'm sure the KGB was very happy to have. So yes, it was very important um, and uh, he did a lot of damage. I don't know what his ranking is, but it's certainly right up there. To my mind, Oliver James and Hansen were the two tops in, in our sort of in our time, um, uh, spies who, who damaged the country. Thank you, David. And I want to get into more about uh, uh, the secrets he divulged and uh, how he did it and uh, ultimately how he was captured. But let's go back in time a bit. And, and David, I'm going to come back to you on this. Uh, having written a book about this uh, gentleman, Robert Hansen, um, his early life, what led him to the FBI? Take us uh, through those years, if you would, briefly. Well, he didn't set out to be an FBI agent. His father wanted him to be a doctor, and he couldn't get into medical school, so he studied dentistry, and then decided he didn't want to spend his life looking at people's mouths, which is understandable, I guess. Unless he didn't you're... like spit, I believe, was his yes, quote, right? Yes, yes, I didn't want to be too graphic. Thank but you. That, that, is, <laughs> that, that is correct. And so he became an accountant, and uh, he became a CPA, and his father was on uh, the Chicago police force, and um, I guess in, he was commander in the Norwood Park area. And uh, I don't know Chicago that well. But eventually he became head of the so-called Red Squad, which was investigating suspected communists, including the League of Women Voters and other dangerous organizations. <laughs> and, and so when people realized what was happening, they cracked down and made the, you know, stopped the Red Squad. But then there were all these files on people. Some of them might have been, you know, communists, but most of them apparently weren't. And so there was a mysterious fire uh, in, in a file cabinet in which all these Red Squad files disappeared. Uh, the file cabinet next to that one was untouched. So it seemed like a very selective fire. And Hansen later told a, a colleague in the FBI that um, yes, his, he was proud of the fact that his dad had run the Red Squad and had in turn destroyed the files. Um, one of the, uh, our guest tonight is Dr. David Charney, whom I'll talk about a little more. And uh, I, I, I wonder, I imagine David has thought a little bit about, as I have too, is about a man whose father was, was trying to hunt down communists in Chicago, and he ends up... Uh, giving secrets, massive secrets, to the communist government. That's kind of food for thought, especially if 
like David, you're a psychiatrist. I am not. I'm just an old police reporter. But still, um, you, you think about things like that. Um, and so from the police force, he, um, he was recruited into the FBI in 1976, about age 31 or 2. And uh, he was assigned at first to Indiana, and then he, he was assigned to New York after the usual training. And in New York, he, he wasted no time. Three years after he'd been recruited into the Bureau, he walked into the uh, GRU, the Soviet Military Intelligence Agency office in New York, and offered his services, and they paid him $30,000. And uh, his, uh, his wife discovered him writing a letter to the, uh, to the Russians down in the basement, and he very guiltily turned it over, and she thought he was having an affair, and he was writing to his girlfriend. But he explained, it's all right, dear, it's just, just the Russians. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just spying for the Russians. So, uh, so she made him, because he'd converted to Catholicism um, uh, after he married his wife, Bonnie, she made him go to uh, Father Bob Bucciarelli, who uh, they had known in Chicago, but who was now in the New York area. And Father Bob said, well, you've got to turn yourself into the authorities and return the money. And, you know, so uh, it seemed like that was the end of his spying career. But the next day, Father Bob called him and said, on second thought, maybe you could give that money to a worthy Catholic charity. <laughs> which is how the, K the GRU money ended up with Mother Teresa. So, <laughs> but I think the important thing out of all this is he, he gives up dentistry and he doesn't get into medical school. He, he works for the Chicago police, he becomes a CPA, uh, joins the FBI, and immediately practically starts working for the Russian intelligence service, their military intelligence service. That's the important thing to remember. And it makes you wonder, he claimed that he read Kim Philby's book at age 14 and decided on this course of action. I, I don't know whether to believe a thing like that, but uh, it may have been retrospective. But you have to wonder about somebody who doesn't, this isn't, you know, some long festering desire to get even with the Bureau or something. This was three years after he joins. He's, he's spying for the GRU and giving money to Mother Teresa. So that that more or less the background of that. Fascinating uh, character and a, a really a contradiction of character. Uh, Mike, I, I'd ask you, um, I know you didn't work directly with Hanson, but uh, tell me what a few contacts you had with him, what was your opinion of this man, and what, were, what was the opinion of his colleagues at the FBI? Sure. Um, so I met him as a young agent, probably about three or four years in, into uh, being an FBI agent at the Washington Field Office, about 1983, 84. Uh, I met him through uh, a, an analyst, um, Jimmy Milburn, who, and Bob King, who uh, helped me on a number of cases. And I didn't think, you know, much of him. He was their supervisor and said hello. Um, I uh, seen him walking around the halls and people say, oh, that's you know, Dr. Death, the mortician, and these, and, and you hear these things about him that were kind of odd but strange, and, and, and you just thought, well, another kind of different guy. Uh, the rumors we had had was that uh, he would um, help some of the analysts in uh, unusual ways. Um, there's one female agent who worked illegals that uh, he kind of helped her understand um, how to work with the Morse code and helped her buy software that the Bureau didn't, aff didn't pay for in order to make her more efficient. And uh, there was a couple analysts, female an anal one analyst that, that uh, named her uh, son after Bob. After he was arrested, she couldn't believe it. She thought we had the wrong guy. Another analyst whom um, he, uh, because he's an Opus Dei uh, recruit, it's like a, a person who quits drinking or smoking, they can become a little obnoxious. He finds out that a couple of these ladies are, are, have boyfriends they're living with and he doesn't approve of their choices, so he starts introducing them into birth control 
ideas unsolicited. Well, that made these ladies a little bit uh, un, uh, unimpressed with his, uh, you know, his political correctness. This is a backdrop. It comes up, and then um, I started working on the uh, um, Yurchenko case um, in '85, and um, come to find out later on that Bob had, had, had been newly transferred up to headquarters, and he'd sneak in and, and talk to Eddie Worthington, who was handling the debriefings from Yurchenko, and he'd say, hey, um, you know, Joe Hagemuel, the ASAC up there, wants these debriefings, and he'd like to get them faster than anybody else in the Bureau. I come down every weekend, just give them to me, and I'll bring them up there, and you don't have to let the mail make these things late. And so Ed said, no, forget it. You know, we're going to do everything according to plan and how we do regular process of disseminating information. And um, he goes to the bathroom, and there's Bob at the famous Xerox machine on the fourth floor, Xeroxing the Yurchenko debriefings. And, you know, Ed says, what the hell are you doing? And so uh, he chastises him and says, don't do this again. There was no mechanism within the Bureau at that time to report anomalous activities of security nature. And so this went unreported, little puff of smoke. You know, uh, 92, I came back from um, uh, an Office of Preference transfer in Nashville uh, uh, resident agency of the uh, Memphis Division. And I came to work on the beginning of um, the, uh, the Ames case, uh, we call it Major Case 43. Um, one of my desk mates in my little cubbyhole at headquarters was a guy named Jim Holt. Jimmy was assigned to work with Gene Vertefe and a couple of people at the agency on trying to call together this list of people who might be culpable uh, in, uh, in, in the lo early losses uh, to the Russians. And on this list, of course, was, was Ames. So Jim's writing this note to the assistant director about what their findings are, joint findings, and how it looks like maybe Rick's a little more culpable than the rest. Um, <clears throat> Bob, down the hall, is uh, in the analytical group. And he decides to hack into Bob, uh, into Jim Holt's computer hacks into the section chief's computer too, Ray Mislocks. And he gets the note that Jim is, uh, is writing instantly and prints it. And another analyst, Bob King, takes a look at it and says, you can't do that. That's not right. What are you doing? Oh, I'm just trying to show how vulnerable the Bureau is on the new computer system, and I'm going to fix it. So Bob says, well, you better go tell the section chief that you did that, or I will. So he goes and reports it to I.C. Smith. And we heard about it. We go to um, uh, Miss Lock. We say, you know, maybe we should fire this guy or something. This is, our stuff's pretty compartmented. And uh, they didn't because they thought, well, he's a good guy, a broken wing employee who went beyond the scope of what he was assigned to do, that took more initiative than anybody was comfortable with. So we, as the, those that were working on these penetration issues, in that unit decided, well, okay, if they're not going to take action against them, let's do a little guerrilla warfare. Let's agree that if we see them in the bathroom, we see them at lunch, we see them in the hall, we're going to walk the other way. If we see them in our area, we're going to kick his ass out of our office. And we won't tell him anything offline. We can't because he's a little different. Not that we thought he was a spy. We just thought he was a little different. So that's kind of my backdrop with him. And later on, when I become uh, a supervisor of a squad at WFO after the arrest of, uh, of Ames, um, and we're looking at some allegations of penetration at an offsite, um, I got a call from Bob sometime between 96 and 98. And he says, uh, hey, Raj, I'm working with this defector, and this fella is interesting because uh, he kind of knows, as I do, what your squad's doing. I said, well, what's that, Bob? 
And he said, oh, you're looking for bad guys in the community. I go, well, how do you know that? He goes, well, it doesn't matter. But look, he's got some ideas on where you can go. So let me give you some names. And I said, you know, why don't you, yeah, give me names. That's great. But, you know, I'm not, I'll send an agent out and, and maybe an analyst out to talk to you. Because of his history and the backdrop of what I explained earlier, we didn't take him seriously. And we think now, post-arrest, that he was actually trying to elicit from us where we were in our look for identifying him as a penetration. He might have been tasked by the Russians, don't know. But it was clearly a very bold and, you know, uh, uh, unusual for him to have called me direct, um, especially since supposedly the rest of the Bureau population didn't know that we were conducting that, that off-site investigation. So, um, a lot of clues that seemingly, uh, in hindsight, might, yeah. might have uh, made him more of a suspect than he was. Right. Uh, but obviously, right. at the time, uh, you didn't have that context. We didn't put it together. The Office of Security didn't collect that kind of information. They've gotten a lot better at it. And, you know, I like to call them puffs of smoke. You know, had we but collected them, we could have been wiser and smarter in reacting and maybe having a predicate just based on his anomalous activities. But, you know, at that time, the Bureau is a forgiving organization. And so we just kind of moved on with it. So maybe we enabled them in that regard. David, uh, your thoughts on this, uh, and Mike may want to comment as well. Uh, after reading your book, after talking to Mike, it, it became clear to me that most spies are recruited by the other country. and some reason they appear vulnerable or they appear that this might uh, appeal to them. Uh, in the case of Robert Hansen, uh, that's not how it happened, that he actually went to the Soviets uh, and then the Russians, uh, once the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, and offered his services to them and more or less controlled the entire relationship over those 22 years. Uh, explain, you know, how he first contacted the Russians and, and um, how he communicated with them over the years. Well, I should have mentioned when you asked about how he got into all of this, into the FBI, I, I forgot to mention that in 1970, I believe, before he was in the FBI, he applied to NSA and was rejected, which means that uh, luckily for NSA, because their secrets might have come out 40 years before Mr. Snowden uh, <laughs> became famous. In any event, um, um, he, uh, he did so in a very simple way. Uh, in 1985, which was a very important year, it was so-called the Year of the Spy. And seven spies were arrested that year. And uh, in October of that year, before a couple of them had been arrested, but some of them had been, the Walker, the Walker ring had been broken, John Walker. Um, and um, he simply wrote a letter to uh, a Russian uh, embassy uh, diplomat, official, but inside the letter was another letter uh, addressed to uh, Viktor Cherkashin, who was the counterintelligence, very shrewd counterintelligence officer of the KGB in the uh, Washington embassy. And it was uh, Cherkashin who uh, earlier that year became the, the supervisor of Alder James who had also walked in some months before, um, and uh, and then handled Hansen. Uh, so that's that's how he did it. That's how he made the contact. But uh, what's interesting to me, again, the psychology. Uh, this was the year of the spy, and you know the, these people were being arrested. Certainly, the Walkers had already been arrested, and uh, it didn't seem to bother. Uh, Mr. Hansen at all, that spies were being rolled up by the FBI. You would think that he might be a little bit cautious and say, well, maybe I better wait a little bit until some of this blows over because they're arresting spies right and left. But it didn't seem to deter him whatsoever. So that's kind of interesting. And then he was indeed, as you've suggested, completely in control of their methods of communication, all done with uh, dead drops, chalk marks, and tapes, 
on signs and telephone poles, and a uh, very cumbersome way to uh, to deal. But you see, a spy can't just go into a payphone, it was before they had cell phones, and uh, call up the embassy, as Mr. Pelton did, which is how he was later identified um, by his voice. But uh, a spy can normally not just make a phone call, so he has to have some more, more clandestine way of communicating with the other side. And this was the tried and true classic way in which uh, the Russians communicated. And being a sort of computer nerd, Hansen kept pushing the Russians and saying, well, we really have to put this stuff on disks, you know. Um, and so finally the Russians agreed and they sent him a disk and the first disk he got, he said, this is wiped clean, there's nothing on it. So you guys got to shape up. All during this period, the Russians only got a glimpse of him once at night. And the claim is that they didn't know who he was. He used the name Ramon, he used other names, but he never used his true name. Um, they, it would seem to me, could have found out who he was by checking his license plate. You can't do that anymore, but at that time you could, in the state of Virginia, find out who, you know, who was driving that car. And they, they had opportunities to see his car, I suppose, but they claimed that they never knew who he was. And uh, so, that was how he did it, and the important thing to remember is from 1985 to 1991, he was very active. And then in 1991, he stopped. Um, and that was just before the collapse of the Soviet Union, and he may have felt that this endangered him. Of course, the Soviet Union collapsed on the 26th of December, 1991, and, uh, and uh, his last communication with the KGB was 10 days earlier on the 16th of December, which happens to be my anniversary. I just thought of that. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I was, uh, I once, I was in Moscow uh, not, about two months before that and uh, uh, working on an article for the New York Times on the, the, the last days of the KGB, which now has simply just changed its initials. Uh, uh, but it was the last days of the KGB. And uh, I think sometime before that, when I was in Moscow, I remember talking to, uh, uh, and this is relevant, because I remember talking to Boris Solomatin, who'd been the resident or big boss in the embassy here for the Russians. And uh, I said to him, Boris, when Walker walked in, and the same question arises with, with Ames and Hansen, these volunteers, walk-ins, I said, how did you know he, Walker was real? And Boris says, he spoke good English, having been here for several years as the resident. He said, how did you know he was real? He said, when he showed me the code keys. <laughs> well, that was a pretty interesting answer. Mike, a couple questions. Uh, one, it's, it's confused me, I guess. Uh, three years into his career as an FBI agent, he's uh, sent to the New York City field office and is uh, involved in counterintelligence and uh, with the Soviets and has access to some of the most sensitive counterintelligence information available. Um, it sounded a little premature to me in terms of his career that he hadn't really paid his dues, proven himself in some obscure field office somewhere. Why was Hansen treated as kind of this fair-haired boy perhaps uh, uh, and moved up uh, the ranks uh, fairly quickly and, and exposed to very sensitive information? So, um, in 1970, 79 or so, um, he was actually, when he began his work in, in uh, the New York field office, he was working in the criminal division. And then he gets transferred to the um, counterintelligence division. Why? Well, he had this expertise in computers and his ability to try and help uh, the intelligence division uh, when it first started um, uh, the computerizing some of the data on the suspected and known intelligence officers was a, an asset to the leadership of the New York division and they traded for him to, to get uh, with the criminal division to get him on board. They had heard that he was so good at computers and so um, that gave him access to, uh, at that time, 
one of the most important cases early on uh, of uh, a re person that was recru recruited, and that's uh, uh, Dmitry Polikov, uh, who was top hat. Um, and when, uh, as David talked about, when he decided to volunteer to the GRU up in New York at that time, um, that was one of the things he told him was that Polikov was uh, working for us. He learned this by looking at some of uh, the computer entries um, that they gave him access to. Now, the GRU at that time weren't real friends with the KGB. So they never told the KGB that they had a, an anonymous source that gave him Polyakov. All he did is kind of remove Polyakov from India and park him away in, in an office. Uh, he goes, and until 1986 or seven, when uh, Ames gives him up, KGB goes to the GRU and then says, hey, you got a problem with this general. He said, oh, we know, but well, why didn't you tell us? Well, then they arrest him and, and interrogate him and uh, execute him about a year and a half later. So, um, you know, these transfers to different divisions within the Bureau are sometimes um, j just accidents, sometimes uh, who you know, and sometimes they really do pull you around uh, into different uh, divisions of the Bureau because of your talents, and, and Hanson did uh, have good talents in, in com computer uh, Was it database. any part of his own plan, though? Did he have any uh, ability to influence uh, the decision-making process and put him in places where he could uh, get access to secrets? Um, you know, that never came out through the debriefings. When post-arrest, uh, Washington Field Office uh, debriefed him 33 times, and uh, there was never an, any indication that, you know, he had this master plan other than David, as David said, he did mention he uh, read The Silent War of uh, Philby, and he actually says he did it when he was 24, and it was too late because it was published in 58. So, um, and you know, you, the Bureau talked post arrest to some of his uh, people who were uh, co students at Northwestern University, and uh, they asked me, so, well, what do you think? These are the same students that told the Bureau that he would make a fine FBI agent when in pre-employment and had all the moral character of one of the best persons that could be a terrific investigator. Well, he said, oh, well, he told us at parties that he wanted to be the greatest spy in the history of the United States. Well, thank you, you know. <laughs> you know, so an FBI agent comes to you for more, a background and, and you forget to tell him that, but you tell him post-arrest that he was a you know, not worthy. Well, let's get this straight, folks. You know, why don't you just tell us these things right from the beginning? And so, I, I, I've heard people say, "Well, why didn't the Bureau dig a little deeper?" People have to tell you things, and you rely on the words of people or references to tell you things. I don't think there was a master plan. David Cherney may know more because he interviewed him as a psychologist uh, or psychiatrist. Um, uh, I think the reason he did this was not for money, even though in the 80s he borrowed $96,000 from his, his mother, which he paid back uh, through, uh, from the fruits of the espionage. Um, I think it was because he thought he was smarter than everybody else. He was a person who was not shown great attention by his superiors and his coworkers. I think many of us agents were busy doing our work, and when we had something important to do, we didn't drag Bob along because he wasn't one of our buddies that went out and had a beer with. He didn't appeal to us as someone that would, it was a source developer or a case breaker. He was a guy who was comfortable around smart analysts with PhDs and he was happy to help drive the wedge between, um, deep in the wedge between the agents and the analysts and manipulate that by getting them to break down compartmentation that they had access to throughout the intelligence community. And 
and get them to share things with him that they shouldn't have shared um, because he befriended them. And like I said, in one case, he got an analyst some software that the bureau wouldn't pay for. He paid for out of his, you know, own money. And so she would tell him things. And when you interview those analysts, they would tell you how they had been dispatched to the, the, the very depths and breadths of the intelligence community to work on highly compartmented projects after the Yurchenko defection. They were told, the Bureau was told, the Presidential uh, Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board said that analysts have to, they're, they're brilliant, they're presidential uh, appointees. These folks need to be dispatched, not selfishly to the Bureau, but throughout the intelligence community working very high, uh, highly compartmented projects. So with, after 85, when Hansen came uh, back into uh, the analytical group, um, uh, after being up in the York, actually I guess it was 88, uh, he comes back in the analytical group for the second time, that becomes a killing ground. And David's right. I mean, a killing ground that he used to grab this highly compartmented stuff that was owned by, not the Bureau, but by the community. And he's able to hide the fact that he's from the Bureau because he's giving away interagency information. He cuts off headers and footers. It's from these analysts. And for attribution, it doesn't look like he's from the Bureau. So the <coughs> KGB is willing to take a look at his production and say, you know what? We don't care what his identity is. We could follow him around. We could set him up. But they instructed those officers that were clearing the drops. They said, no, don't do that. You will make him mad. If he discovers that you're lingering, you will make him mad, and we will have inactivity from a highly productive source. We can't afford that. So they were willing to go with the preponderance of the evidence, the preponderance of the information that he gave, and say it's bona fide. Who cares? And, and that was their judgment. And they're willing to throw, you know, 50,000, 20,000 at, at a pop on a drop and, and, and live with it. And uh, by 1989, um, according to um, our best information, he had uh, between 85 and 89, and, uh, 89 their accounting in the KGB was that he had given 6,000 uh, pages of documents. Mm -hmm. Mostly Xerox on the fourth floor Xerox machine, which didn't have a counter on it, didn't have a pin number on it. And, you know, a couple times he ferreted <coughs> out top secret documents that he demanded back that were originals. And, uh, and they did, they give them back to him at other drops. But, I mean, very smart and sneaky, but uh, again, um, I'd say when you look at the rationale, it doesn't make sense to any of us because it's not something any of us would partake in. And so you try and get inside the head of a spy. It's like, I guess, trying to figure out a serial killer. I, you know, I think there's conflict there. You know, I, I don't know. It's, 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 it's really hard for me to figure. I can't walk in those shoes. Like my friend Dave Murphy used to say, walk a mile in his moccasins. Well, I can't. You know, that's a walk I don't want to take. So You mentioned uh, Polikoff top hat. Uh, just for uh, clarification purposes, I, I've done a little reading about uh, that uh, spy uh, for the Russians on our behalf. Um, he was, for more than 20 years, perhaps our greatest provider of, of Soviet intelligence uh, and when that asset was lost based on what Hansen had done, um, that, that was a great loss to the United States. So I uh, just wanted everybody to understand that giving up Top Hat was uh, perhaps uh, the greatest loss of uh, uh, intelligence assets that we had in terms of a, a Soviet spy helping us. Um, David, let me ask you this. Uh, you alluded to this, and I, I just uh, I'm fascinated by how spies are able to communicate with, in this case, with the Soviets and, and the Russians um, without them ever knowing his identity. In other words, they couldn't reach him and you know, call him on his cell phone or, or reach out to him whenever they wanted to. Uh, they had to wait until he was ready to come to them. 
Um, and as I understand it, he did that a lot in, in letter writing uh, and, and did it anonymously, of course, to try to protect his identity. I think uh, Ramon Garcia, as you said, was his alias that he used. Um, but I'm, 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 I don't understand how he's able to give them secrets, tell them where to find those secrets at his appointed hour, uh, and then how do they negotiate a, an award, uh, a reward for that? Uh, how, how much money do I get for this particular bag of documents that I'm giving you? Um, ex can you explain a little bit about how all that works? Well, it, Microphone, please. It was up to the Russians as to how much money they would give them. They'd give them $50,000 or $100,000 or $10,000. And I don't think there's any record that he said, well, I want this much. He did ask for diamonds at one point, and he got three diamonds. Now, Mike, Mike mentioned money, the, the money that he'd borrowed from his mother. Um, and people tend to discount the money uh, as, as a motivation. But uh, having been paid more than $600,000 by the Russians, I'd like to see a show of hands of anybody here who wouldn't want an extra $600,000 if it came their way without breaking any laws. Uh, so I don't see any hands going up. So, uh, so he was. Um, he, he was happy to have that much money, and partly that was to prove to his wife he was a good provider. But this was a very uh, complex man. Uh, he was a bundle of contradictions, because here you have a guy whose father, as I mentioned earlier, is chasing so-called Reds, and he ends up as a Russian spy. Uh, he's a family man, apparently uh, a, a good father, family man, and yet became involved with a, uh, a stripper, Pat Priscilla Sue Gailey, took her to Hong Kong on an ins official inspection trip. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there was some inspecting going on there in the hotel room. <laughs> um, and uh, I had to interview Priscilla Sue as part of my research, and I want to tell you, my wife was very understanding. <laughs> she understood that it had, had to be done. And I was in a hotel with her in Boston for two days, not sharing a room, I want to make that clear. But we did have long interviews. And uh, but we're a complex man. I mean, here he is, he's Opus Dei and goes to mass every day, you know, without exception, I think. And yet he's a Russian spy. So, you know, go figure. Well, um, the... Of course I wanted to interview him, and that was not possible. It's still not possible. He's totally under wraps, under something called a SAM, which stands for Special Administrative Measures, which means he's in this box he built for himself and gets out one hour a day if he's lucky, and nobody can go see him and no one can contact him, except his lawyer and his wife. So um, in the Supermax in Florence, Colorado, from which no one has ever escaped, that's where he is now. So uh, complex, complex guy and a bundle of contradictions. And, uh, and you have to ask, um, I had this, you always hope when you're writing a book you're gonna have some kind of a break, something good will come your way. And the break for me was, I don't know whether I should advertise this, but apparently Robert Hansen had read some of my books and thought they were pretty good. And so he gave permission to David Charney uh, to talk to me. David Charney being the psychiatrist who interviewed him in his jail cell after he was arrested, of course, for many hours. And, of course, that was a tremendous break for me because I was able to look at something inside the mind of Hansen as he had spoken to his doctor. And normally that would be very confidential, but Hansen said, no, go ahead and talk to him. <laughs> and uh, that was the kind of break that, you know, writers hope for. And in this case, it was very useful that Dr. Charney, who I think really understands Hansen's mind, was able to share some of that with me and the motivations, very complicated uh, set of motivations that he had. But one of them certainly was money, which I mentioned. Uh, that was a lot of money. And the diamonds, diamonds are easy to conceal, so spies like them. But eventually he decided he wanted cash, and he turned, I think, two of them back, kept one, and turned two of them back for cash. And the Russians, Russians very obligingly uh, gave him cash for the diamond. So um, he was um, 
I don't know whether we should get into this in a, in a family group here, but I mentioned I'm an old police reporter, so in New York, and I've seen a lot, and I'm not easily shocked, I can tell you that. But in researching this book, I was shocked when I discovered that he arranged for his closest friend, Jack Hoshauer, to watch him, Hanson, having sex with his wife, Bonnie, on a closed circuit television when Jack Hoshauer would come and visit him. Um, and, uh, you know, he would ask, Hush hour, you know, how was it? You enjoy the show, and I mean, I was shocked. I'm, I'm, I'm quite willing to admit that. I've never run into anything quite like that. And uh, being technical, of course, it wasn't any, it was difficult for him to set up the closed circuit television. <coughs> at first, Hush hour was looking through a window, as Hans and his wife were having marital relations, but that, you know, it could get cold out there in Vienna, Virginia, standing out there looking through the window. So Bob said, well, we can set up a, you know, television. So a Hush Hour could go down and turn on the sex channel, and it was, you know, it was his friend Hanson. They'd been friends from Chicago from high school, and they were still frat boys together, and I guess they thought this was, you know, something that frat boys would do. Uh, again, very complicated guy. I mean, this was crazy. Um, and toward the end of his uh, of his uh, spying career, as he began to get nervous, it was coming to an end, he wrote things to the Russians that stick in my mind. He said things like, I'm either insanely loyal to you or, or just insane. Uh, interesting. He didn't know which he was. He began to realize he was he was strange and that his actions were strange and he, he said, I may be insane. Um, and uh, the Russians handled him very cleverly. They played to his ego and uh, uh, Vladimir Kruchkov, the head of the KGB, wrote him not one but several letters congratulating him on his fine work for the Soviet Union. Uh, designed to stroke him and improve his ego. And uh, uh, he was, uh, uh, I'm sure, happy to get those letters from the, from the big boss in Dzerzhinsky Square, uh, or Yasnevo. And uh, so uh, it's very hard to figure him out, really. And David Charney helped me do that, and I think I did, you know, come to understand a little bit might be a good opportunity um, to go to our good friend, Dr. Charney. If I could have a staff uh, microphone up here, I think uh, we have some handhelds that we can bring up here. But uh, who better to talk about the, uh, the psychological motivations, perhaps, this uh, try to help us understand this contradictory figure, this devout Opus Dei Catholic, goes to Mass each and every day, allows his best friend to view him and his wife having sex. He has an affair with a stripper. Um, and he's a patriot, supposedly, when he becomes an FBI agent, conservative in his political beliefs. His father helped uh, try to rid uh, communism uh, back in the day, and yet he turns into a spy uh, against his own country. Uh, and Dr. And I, Charney. I have to apologize for, for Dr. Charney for roping him in here. And <laughs> I'm, I don't know that he was prepared to, to, to be part now, of we, this. We but, talked earlier, and yeah. uh, the doctor said he, he would be glad to share uh, some of his uh, understandings of this uh, very complex man. So please, Dr. Charney. I am able to talk about it because of in the meetings with Bob Hansen, he explicitly gave me permission to be able to convey the essence of what was inside of his mind as a teaching opportunity to the intelligence community as a cooperative measure in terms of all the work that we did together over a year. I met with him for two hours a week for an entire year. I'm not going to tell you that was the most pleasant time of my life. <laughs> going into a prison was bad enough. But Bob was very starved at that point in his life for human contact that was not adversarial. Think about it. You're in a jail and everybody hates you. You meet with a few people on a regular basis, the good people that do damage assessments, 
but you can notice that they want to spring across the table and grab you by the throat and kill you. So that's one category of person. The other one are your own attorneys. And apologies to attorneys in the room, but attorneys like to talk. <laughs> they don't like to listen as much. They want to tell you what to do and guide your case. So there is Bob, isolated in a jail cell, having these two categories of people, and in comes a shrink who just keeps his mouth shut. What a lovely opportunity to let it all come out. And with two hours, he had a lot to say. And in fact, really, most of the occasions that I met with him, it was the sound of the strident bell ending visiting hours that ended our talks because he would have gone on for another half hour, easy. Now, circling back to the psychology, what I learned from Bob and from two other spies that I worked with, I put into a concise statement that I don't pretend answers everything, but it gives you a good start. And it's this. The foundation of it comes from an intolerable sense of personal failure as privately defined by that person. Privately defined by that person. Meaning, you could look at their life and say, okay, yeah, you had hard knocks, it was difficult, well, it wasn't that bad. Well, it doesn't matter what you think. It matters what the person thinks. And now we have to circle to this other very important thing, which is male pride and ego. At least 95% of insider spies are male. And so I figured out, being a physician, that there's a genetic indicator for what makes people become insider spies. The Y chromosome. <laughs> you're dealing with male psychology and you're always de dealing with male pride and ego. And if you start off in life experiencing something that could only be put into one key word with Bob and that was feeling belittled at the hands mainly of his father. His father was a real tough Chicago cop, was not warm and friendly, and actually was very hard on Bob. And Bob told me a number of uh, anecdotes that were very disturbing to him, even in the retelling. In fact, it was in the very first meeting with Bob that he told me about being wrapped into a, a, a carpet by his father as a form of punishment. Picture that. But it stood out in his mind, and it was still very alive for him. So if you're dealing with somebody who on the interior feels that they are a failure in some key way, then you know that there are going to be many experiences, we all have them, where you have more failure shoved down your throat. I mean, who hasn't had experiences of failure in their life? But if you have one key big one at the beginning, then all the rest add up and pile up. But as you were saying, both of you, he's a very complicated guy, and there's no one explanation because he also knew that he was very smart. And he was very smart. I have to add that he wasn't quite as smart as how he thought he was. But he was smart. To give you an example of that, there was one occasion that he explained to me that if he wanted to, he could communicate with the KGB or SVR from his prison cell. What? <laughs> he went into a technical explanation, which I did understand as he laid it out, that he was permitted to have a TV set in, his, um, in the wall of his cell and th there were no knobs on it because that would be dangerous, so they had a remote controller. And he understood that that worked with um, infrared. And he knew that if he pressed the buttons in the right way, he could develop Morse code communication. And if somehow he got the word out to the KGB 
They could be on a hill on the other side of Alexandria, pointed at this window, and read his Morse code communications. That's the kind of smart he had. Who knows if that could actually be done. The last thing I want to mention that you already mentioned a bit, and that is one key thing that we learn about in our field, and that's called, oddly enough, it's a term in the field of intelligence, compartmentalization. That's a word that we use in psychiatry, too. It's a way of a person somehow being able to wall off parts of their life, their personality, and keep them in separate compartments. And you say, how, do you, how can a person do that? I must tell you that I do that every day in my work. Why? When I start an appointment with somebody, a patient, I've got to be in the compartment that is that person's life and put away all the other things that I've been thinking about, the other patients before or after. I'm with that person in their world, and then when that session is over, shut that door, move on to the next. So I'm not going to say to you that this is an abnormal thing. I think we all do it. Except he did it even better than any of us could do in this audience. He was able to compartmentalize and be a Russian spy, a very devout Catholic, um, a very loyal, get this, special agent of the FBI. And how do I know that? Because he would tell me constantly ways that the FBI could improve itself, the things that he had done, the people that he brought to the FBI to help build up the FBI, such as uh, John Boyd, who was a brilliant Air Force officer who had a, a vast different way of looking at things. He told me, I brought him to the Bureau and they just had no interest in him at all. But look what they could have learned. And this is the spy telling me this. As you said, go figure. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Charney. Very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask you something? Um, w w one of the things about um, Bob that um, kind of was puzzling to us was uh, um, his relationship certainly with his, his father and, and uh, yet in the things that you were able to get from him relative to that were very helpful to everyone to understand. But Vivian, his mom, seemed to think that his childhood was just fine. I mean, how can she live in that same household and not see the dysfunction and kind of the deterioration of his ego, male ego or whatever it is, that kind of pushes him into this. I, I just don't understand that. Well, I'll try to explain that a little bit. You know, the issue comes up in any family where there are, say, three or four or five children, and one comes out great, and the others are normal, and one is real horrible. <laughs> and you say, how could that be? You know, this is a lovely set of parents, and they did so well with these, but what happened to that one? Uh, not sure, but one of the theories about it, separate from genetics, of course, is thinking about microcultures within a family. We all come from families, and we know that the relationships and the tone of the feelings that g occur between a father and a daughter, and a father and some sons, and a mother and all that, it's all on different wavelengths. It's almost like different radio stations. And somebody on one station can't totally get what's going on on the other radio station. They're not tuned in. So the, I could picture the mother would not get it because she, wasn't, she didn't get guy psychology, for one thing. Well, do guys get women's psychology? Forget about it. <laughs> do women understand guy psychology? Not that much, really. It's stuff that guys know about guys and women know about women, and that could have gone right over her head. Thank you. I want to um, ask, uh, Mike, you one final question of mine. I may have others, but uh, I want to then go to the audience and give you all a chance to ask a few questions, I'm sure, that are on your mind, and we'll have staff uh, here with microphones uh, to assist you in that. 
But uh, Mike, I, we, we've got to conclude at least this part of the program with uh, a story that you had told me earlier today, and that's really how you ultimately caught Robert Hansen, figured out that he was this spy that you all had been looking for for really a decade or more, and, uh, and, and also include a bit about your, your first initial suspect uh, was a guy named Brian Kelly, a CIA operative, um, and, and you were so focused on him that perhaps you all didn't see Robert Hansen as clearly as you might have. But tell us the story that ended the spy career of Robert Hansen. Sure. Um, I'll take you back to um, a uh, time that's just after the um, arrest, conviction, and sentencing of, uh, of Rick Ames, 1994. Um, I'm just finishing up my work at headquarters, and, and um, I'm asked by uh, Bear Bryant and um, Steve Dillard to put in for a desk at WFO, and, and um, this desk, the squad, is to look at some multiple allegations of penetration of the intelligence community that are not attributable to, to Ames. Um, the squad that was d conducting the Ames case was also starting firing up on the Pitts case out of New York. So Another FBI spy. They co-located my squad with, uh, with um, that squad, um, and we helped each other. Mike Donner became the, the supervisor of that group. Um, I stole some of the best talent from uh, the Washington field office uh, in order to staff my squad, about 14, 15 people. Um, I'd come and talk to them on their, off, on their squad, and I'd uh, just say hello, and haven't seen you in a while, and are you happy here? And wouldn't tell their supervisor. And, and so I took Dillard up on his challenge. He said, hey, uh, I want this guy, that woman, and that person, and, and after I talked to them for four or five minutes, they get this funny call from Gallery Row to take a polygraph, and uh, they started figuring it out, you know, because after I'd show up, they'd get this call, and then the next thing after they pass polygraph, I, they'd know is that their desk is empty and their supervisor doesn't see them anymore, and they're assigned to me, so it's kind of funny. Um, uh, the the uh, The effort that we start is we know, without a doubt at that time, there exists a penetration that the KGB considered to be worse than Ames, and uh, they didn't know who it was. And um, we built up, we knew some things were compromised and not attributable to Ames, not attributable to Pitts. So, and this is very difficult uh, for agents in the field not to have a person to in investigate with a name. It's terrible. It's most disturbing. It's frustrating. So, and then to also have what I set up were some analysts that were just brilliant in building matrices. And they were able to work on building a uh, matrix of an compromised cases and operations. Mm -hmm. And we kind of numbered these compromisers and said, okay, placement and access to these things is between 58 and 62 that changed at any given time. Uh, it's kind of a fluid matrix. Uh, and, and so um, we listed people who had access to these things. Two critical elements of, uh, that were in this matrix was one, the person probably worked in the counterintelligence center of the CIA, which makes us believe that it was probably a, an agency person. S uh, second was that this person worked on uh, and had access to and helped the Bureau with the Felix Block case. So. We, and then, of course, we looked in the Soviet European division of the agency, too, uh, because it was a logical place for some of these operations and cases that went south. And we, we worked with a very trusted 
group of analysts and investigators and case officers at the agency that were really brilliant. And we'd sit around and we'd actually vote as a group on culpability potential for these folks that were on our list. We started off with a list of about 200, 245 case officers. We'd look at their security and personnel files. We'd look at their psycho psychological profiles because they'd periodically be talking to people like David and uh, get assessed. And, uh, and we'd look at medical things to see if they were vulnerabilities, look at their financial things. And, and we'd come up with folks that we thought then uh, fit this matrix. And we culled it down from about 200 to 25 or so, down to 50, down to about 34, and then down to a, a key 17 um, persons, all of whom were innocent. And at the end of the day, none of them had any culpability. Robert but Hansen was not on that list. Robert Hansen was not on that list because we were looking in the agency. One of the key pieces that we were looking at was, you know, this person was able to give the KGB specific information that helped them rebuild, reorganize Line KR, Director K, like the new division of the Counterintelligence Center that the CIA had stood up. So, isn't that interesting? So using that and then taking the block case, um, we looked at, you know, poor Brian Kelly, who had worked on that case and gotten a DCI award for very good work in identifying Mr. Gickman as an illegal who was in touch with Felix Bloch over in France. And the unfortunate part that uh, Brian had was his access mirrored that of, um, of Hansen. And we also misattributed some of those elements were just incorrect. We were wrong. So uh, by basing our initial look on analytical findings uh, in looking at that matrix, it, it was incorrect. At the same time, so we're pressing on and we're kind of uh, desperate because we think we're still losing cases and things and operations. It, but it, it, at the same time, we had a parallel operation which we started in the mid-80s. And it was based on a fellow named Yurchenko, the defector. His idea, he said, you know, I remember him saying to me, he said, uh, you know, when we had a problem with sources in the CIA or the FBI or the State Department, we decided that we would get together and we'd make a list of folks we knew worked in those places. And we'd be willing to pay maybe a million bucks if they'd cooperate with us. It kind of helped our asset pool. So we thought, oh, that's interesting. So um, what we did is on another track, working with the agency, we made a list of people who were on board a retired KGB officers and decided these are American targets officers who, if we interviewed them, and they would tell us the ground truth in what's inside of their head about culpability of uh, Americans who had been spies for the Russians, we could solve some issues and we could just let them go away and we'd pay them a million bucks. So a couple of us got together and, and with the uh, signed permission of uh, the DCI, of uh, the CIA, and the director of the FBI, Webster, and Judge Webster actually signed this, this memorandum, and every director after that did. We would each commit equal parts of a million dollars to try and get someone who would help us resolve this penetration. And um, so I pitched lots and lots of Russians uh, around the world and did it in conjunction with the agency, and they did it along with me here in the U.S. And it was great team effort. Um, and so come about the year 2000, when we're, we're in the midst of the wrong chase and investigating the heck out of a couple innocent people, including Brian, um, we, uh, I have an opportunity to go and talk to someone. 
in. Um, we have a mechanism to invite them over to the United States. And uh, I'm able to uh, say, hey, you know, um, interdict them on the streets of New York and say, hey, look, how you doing? I don't know him from Adam. And uh, he looks at me like I'm goofy and says, hey, who are you? I give him a business card. He looks at it. And I, he says, uh, what do you want? I says, well, let's sit down. Let's just sit down here and have a drink. He says, I don't drink with strangers. And I said, well, okay. Um, don't have a drink. I'll sit down and have a beer with some water. And uh, he's playing with my business card and looking at me and says, do you have any credentials to validate what this card says? Yeah, sure. Here you go. More roast beef, that's me. And, uh, and he says, you know, I'm, what I'm going to do with this business card, he says, I'm going to go to the Russian mission to the United Nations. Give this to the security officer. I'm going to have him um, take that to the New York Times, and we're going to put it on the front of the New York Times that you have ruined my business opportunity as a, for, as a former Russian diplomat. And, uh, and, you know, your name will be all over the front page of the Times for being a provocateur. I said, um, you know, probably that's fiction. Probably nobody at the New York Times gives a rat's ass about you, but I care about you. You know, you'd be lucky that thing appears in the New York Times comic strip. I want to make you the most successful Russian-American businessman in the history of our two countries. This is serious. Only the director of the CIA and the director of the FBI know that I'm here. Nobody else. And he said, you know, how am I going to eat? I said, well, he says, you know, my, my t ticket is... I have to stay here for a couple weeks. I said, I know. I said, just what happens, I'm going to be up here for two weeks. I'll take you to lunch, dinner, breakfast every day. Let's start with uh, a lobster dinner on the director of the FBI tonight. <laughs> so I said, I'll meet you in three or four hours. He said, if I show up, I'll come with the security officer from the United Nations. And will, will you pay for him? I said, sure, no problem. I show up. I asked my, my guys who uh, accompanied me there, and I said, was he in touch with the security officer? No, the only call he made was to uh, get the um, two-ounce uh, bottles refilled in the uh, refrigerator. So he shows up, and he's a little off balance, and I don't blame him. <laughs> and we go and have a dinner. And and he's um, very aggressive, pretty much telling me that you can forget it, I'll never cooperate, and I should just pack my bags and go home. This is a fool's errand. So um, I go back and talk to my team and say, it's not going to work. This is uh, a waste of time. I've talked to a number of others, and. I understand when you ask somebody to dance and they don't want to dance, you don't dance, you know. So it's, we're done. And they said, no, 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 Mike. He's, he's still there. He wants to meet with you. Uh, keep meeting with him. He may just have a change of heart. If he shows up, you have a dialogue, and the relationship is there. If he doesn't show up, then it's over. So I, they kept kicking me out the door, and I didn't want to go. And it was, and it was interesting. Over a couple week period, um, I, mean, I was getting counter pitched and told how I could make a lot of money over there. And you know, if I would show up in his neighborhood, and I'd say, no, it's not about me, it's about you. And, um, and finally, uh, we had a, a Tullamore in some Irish bar. And uh, <laughs> he's laughing, Betsy. I know we used to call it, tell me more, dude. 
because uh, we were drinking, tell him where to. But he says, uh, I'd like to tell you about something. And, um, and he starts telling me about something. And the specifics of which I won't go into, but it was very startling. So he says, I can tell you everything about it. He said, but um, it's, it's important that we have trust and that I know that it goes no further except to your director and the director of the agency. I said, sure, no problem. Um, I said, if we're going to enter into this, then we're going to go up into a hotel room and get off the streets. And we're going to start talking seriously about what we can do for you. And um, so we, we go to a room and we negotiate, I'll call it a contract, what he wanted and what we were willing to provide. And um, he wanted me to sign the contract. I said, no, I'll be your advocate. But, you know, the director of the FBI will sign it. It'll be Louis Frey. Um, so, and it'll be seen by uh, the agency's director. I said, you know, we're in it to, again, make you the most successful guy in, our, in the history of businessmen of our two countries. So uh, we sent it back in get some very frantic calls over the um, uh, uh, secure calls from headquarters and from the agency. Um, and they say, is this for real? And we go, yeah, it's for real. So um, we bring the agency in and facilitate a mechanism to have an exchange of what he says he has, which is the whole file of the interaction between 85 and 91, the KGB had with this guy, but they don't know who he is. They don't know where he works. And they just know he's in the community. And uh, so we said, okay, we'll take that bet. And he said, well, I have some forensic information too that you might want that I'll put in there too. And um, we wait. He goes back home. He doesn't show up for an important exchange. I had a couple folks in the Bureau that called me up and say, hey, you just wasted the agency's money because the Bureau didn't pay the upfront money that he demanded. The agency paid the money. God bless them. And, and they're very good about that. Mikey Sulik will always be my hero. Um, so what we do is find a, a mechanism to be in touch with him again. And we get him to uh, tell us why he didn't show up, get another date, time, and place solid. And the pros from Dover are able to meet with him and bring that stuff home. We train the station, the overseas station of the agency, in the rules of federal criminal procedure, which is we put them on a green sheet, which means it's upon receiving the information, it became evidence. First time ever that I know that ever that happened. And so because they were on a green sheet, we met them at the airport along with a case agent from WFO, and we brought that information to headquarters, not to WFO, and we gave it to the laboratory. And within four or five hours, we had Louis Free and his deputy Tom Picard looking at it, and he said, "This is pretty astounding." I said, "Yeah, it is." And then he said, "Hey, go on over and brief the Attorney General tomorrow." And and <laughs> Director Free looks at Picard and says, "I'm going to the International Association Chiefs of Police meeting in Chicago uh, tomorrow, so you can take Mike over there." And Tom looks at him and goes, "No, I'm going there too, boss." And so is Ashcroft. So, um, <laughs> so. Uh, they both look at me and say, well, Mikey can do the briefing tomorrow. Don't worry. This is cool. They'll all like it. Just tell the new deputy attorney general all about this. So I go over there. I don't, I'm a GS-14 at that time. I'm thinking, geez, I'm, I'm in high water. I don't know what to do. So I go over there, give them a little briefing, and um, 25 attorneys show up, and a new deputy attorney general shows up, and his name is Bob Muller. And so I brief him about this case, and after he's done, he says, Mike, that's the coolest case I ever, I ever heard. He says, that, is this for real? I go, yeah. He says, um, are you guys ready to do what you got to do? And, 
you know, Tim Beresny was our section chief for Russian matters. Um, and uh, he worked with Tim Caruso at WFO. And uh, they started briefing people away from the Brian Kelly case one by one and uh, made Stephen Plute the case agent and um, actually teamed up with uh, Doug Gregory to be the co-case agent from Tony Buckmeyer's squad. And within a month and a half, two months, okay, we opened that case on November 15th, November 16th. So he's arrested February 18th, President's Day, Jack Blatt's birthday. He still tells me, thank you for the gift every year. Um, the, uh, it's what, phenomenal to me. Three months, they write a 100-page affidavit. Why was it such a big affidavit? Why did it have so much information from a sensitive source? Well, the reason it did is because Ashcroft wanted to make this a capital punishment case, with good reason. My source had agreed to, beyond all uh, hope, he, he agreed to be a witness if I would be an advocate for him to help keep his identity quiet in front of a judge, which I did. So since he, he agreed to that, we prepared him to testify. And Randy Bellows, the prosecuting attorney, worked with John Dyan of the uh, espionage section of the Department of Justice to put the information forward in that 100-page affidavit and let the defense see the preponderance of the information and that the government was prepared to go to capital punishment case on this. Based on, out of those three people that were executed, it was really the case of Martinov. Barry Martino, that would have caused, uh, that we would have presented in court. So that's why there was so much information in there. And it was, for my next two, three months, I had to deal with my uh, source well, thank for the rest of my life, for being uh, tenacious, courageous, and determined to help us. And uh, even though he didn't want to testify, he was willing to do it. So, um, so that was, that was kind of, that's how we came to understand it wasn't Brian. And within this documents that we got was a folder. And in this folder, it said, do not open until you see me. So even though we got this stuff on November 4th or 5th, uh, we didn't see my source again until the 15th of November. So, uh, so we look at that stuff, and it turns out Hansen gave his biggest dump to the Russians on November 12th. We hadn't had the case open yet. We missed that dump, but we were in receipt of the culpability of Hansen, right? So we see him, and he goes, hey, did you open that stuff? He goes, no, he says not to open it. He says, well, hey, open it. It's got forensic information. We did. It had the thumbprint, the fingerprint on the back, and it had a tape recording of Hansen's interaction with a guy named Alexander Fifilov in uh, August of 86. They tape recorded a phone call. And who listened to that tape to identify him? Two crackerjack analysts, Jim Milburn and Bob uh, King. And they were in my office the next morning telling me that we had the wrong guy in Bryant. And we have to go forward with Bob because it's Bob that's guilty. So I said, you guys go ahead and brief the assistant director. You know, you, you earned this. And so they did. And uh, the rest is kind of history. You know, maybe I went in too much. You made the rest. Interesting. The, the WFO did, made the arrest, yeah. They, and they, they built the case. They really did. It was a fantastic effort by hundreds of agents and analysts. And uh, we, we couldn't break the, uh, the disk that my source had gave and couldn't look into. They gave us several disks. So we had to use the community efforts to bring people in from the Fort, uh, Fort Meade and from the agency to actually break the disks of his communication with the Russians. So 
And then you negotiated with Hanson, mm -hmm. uh, so he wouldn't get the death penalty, so his family would still get his re retirement benefits right. uh, if he agreed to divulge a lot of the secrets that he had uh, uh, given the, the Soviets and the Russians. And, uh, yeah. and then he went to jail for the rest of his life, 15 consecutive life uh, uh, without parole sentences, and uh, Robert Hanson will never see the light of day ever again. He serves now 23 hours a day in solitary, one hour he's let out to exercise, and uh, it's not a good life for him, but uh, we got a lot of the secrets we wanted in the end. Um, but I'd like, that's a fascinating story and, and how it all came to an end. Uh, in the last few minutes that we have, I, I would like to open it up for any questions that the audience might have. And somebody has a microphone, help us out here, guys. All right, let's start uh, right here. I'd like to ask a question because I've been waiting for 40 minutes now. Excuse me, I have a security Excuse guard me. coming. I have two questions. We need to let this One, Excuse I would me, like to know how oh, Robert Excuse Hassan me. got his money. Excuse me, ma'am. Thank Please. you. And two, I would like Excuse to know. If we could have a question. Please. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I just want to disclose that I am Patricia Kelly. I am Brian Kelly's widow. And so my question is twofold, and, I, and just as a backdrop, um, Brian was, for, for three to four years, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He was under surveillance, including <clears throat> helicopters, false flags, pretense, um, uh, what do you call those things? Polygraphs, okay. And I am an attorney, too, and I promised David I won't go on. But... Um, and, so, and he was walked out of the agency, and for 18 months he was out in, out in the cold, not knowing whether he was going to be charged with, he was never charged, but he was suspected of espionage, okay. And so, and there were, my understanding is that there were one-third of the squad believed that he was innocent, okay. So my first question, I have two of them, and the second one's a quicker one. But the first question is, is why did the FBI stridently investigate Brian after really all that you got at least publicly and others probably classified that I don't know anything about that Brian probably didn't know anything about but the only piece of information you received was a, a jogging map that was it he was interrogated his his daughter was interrogated his two sons they put two FBI agents on them in New York and Kentucky two agents this is all like a, a, a um, uh, yeah, like a movie, I, I suppose. I, probably that's par probably the best way to you know describe it. So I get, so that's my first question. My second question, and this is of Mr. Rochford, is in November, November fifteenth of two thousand. That's when you actually opened up and heard, and forensically it was identified that it was the prints and the voice, not of Brian Kelly, but of Robert Hansen. And so my question is, why did the FBI or the system leave Brian out in the cold from November 15th until Hansen's arrest? Actually, uh, Brian didn't find out about anything until, uh, until it was on the news uh, the day after President's Day in 2000. And so that's my second question. Why is it that he was left out in the cold like that? I, I could sit here and ask another 100 questions, but we can do that another time. So that's Thank my, my uh, questions. And thank you, too. I did want to say one other thing, Mr. Rochford. Thank you for stating publicly in this forum that the FBI was wrong. Yeah. I appreciate that. My family appreciates that also. Thank you. It's been a long time coming, you know, uh, for a public acknowledgement of the Bureau that, that we were wrong. And what drove us was his placement and access. There's nothing that Brian did in any aspect of the investigation that made us feel that uh, – you know, he had passed anything to the Russians. We were looking, we based the case on compromise operations and compromised agents. And he had the closest, freshest access at the time that those things went south. Uh, plus, I mean, I have to tell you, Prime was the first uh, location of a dead drop and one that um, this source had continued to use like 17 times in the first year in his interaction with the KGB in 1985. 
that was not a way park, and that's where Brian did his running stuff there. So this, some of the uh, information that we had relative to movements and activities and parks and stuff, it was where Russians who were picking up this classified information, 6,000 documents between 85 and 91, we're meeting with this source and we're going, oh my goodness, you know. Uh, it was um, the drive that we had really was based on a sincere, honest belief that we could be losing sources on a continuing basis unless we plug the hole. What we did was in consultation with attorneys and, and, uh, and with uh, um, the um, senior levels of the CIA. And um, when we identified Hansen, we went to senior leadership in the agency and we said, look, it's your employee. It's up to you when you bring him back. And um, we were told that, look, if we bring him back into the agency at that time, that day, your, your subject is going to know because he'll see that you're bringing in your most, you know, your, your biggest suspect. And he may discontinue contact with the Russians and you need to have this meet, right? You go, yeah. Well, let's put this on hold and freeze it. And we at the agency will take that, that responsibility. We were ready for them to, to reinstate him and bring him back into the building. But it was our cooperation with the agency at that level, right up to the, I mean, right up to the to tenant, you know, and uh, to give us three, four months to make the case and um, and then after that they would deal with uh, with Brian. So um, so we said, okay, fine. You know, we it, it was it was very difficult. I mean, if I had anything to do over again, it would be not to open up the case on Brian, but because uh, it was it was the wrong we had the wrong output. However, when we looked at the at the uh, compromise operations that would drive from analytical looks, it was like, gosh, you know, how do we move on? So if we would have moved on from Brian, okay, we would have, before my source information, we would have gone on to another set of innocent people because we were looking again at the agency, right? Um, and there are times when you just have to go forward with looking at unknown subjects in order to try and identify a culpable bad boy. Uh, and uh, we did it in the, uh, the case of Rudolph. Remember, they were looking at Pearl, and uh, even Director Free thought it was Pearl. Um, so, uh, and that doesn't make it any easier for you, I know, and I'm sorry for all the pain and, and, uh, that was brought to you and your family. And, uh, but it, it, we, we, we felt like we were on the right set of trails. We were, if we'd have only been not so egotistical as to just look at the agency, we'd have looked internally, we probably would have seen, um, seen Brian. It's interesting, when uh, Pitts was arrested, uh, 96, 97, he got interviewed down in Kentucky by the case agent. And one of the things the inspector general, when he looked at our investigation, said, hey, Pitts was asked if he knew of any other culpable spies in the bureau. And he said, oh, you should look at Hanson. <laughs> well, we didn't think anything of it. As investigators at in 97, 98, why? Because here's some baseless comment from a guy who's in jail for the rest of his life for espionage, and he's giving us no solid facts to tell us what his gut 
reasoning is for giving us that information. So, but he was right, right? So that made it all the more bitter for us when the Inspector General looks at this thing. Um, it, when the Inspector General uh, looked at our investigation, that was one of the main criticisms was that they thought we were locked on to Brian too, too heavily at the, uh, during the course of all this unsub look. And, uh, you know, in retrospect, we probably were. Um, but, you know, I would say we had a, it was a group growth, but it wasn't my singular decision. It was certainly some, a lot of buy in from the senior leadership of the Bureau and the agency. We brought it to FISA court judges, and, uh, you know, we, it was all within the context of rule of law and stuff. So, so it was nothing, it, you know, from a personal point of view, I know you, you probably look at it as reckless. We didn't look at it that way. We looked at it as extremely aggressive at the end of a case in order to try and get where we want, we needed to go, and it was, uh, again. And I think it proves that the Robert Hansen spy case hurt a lot of people. Some people died. Certainly hurt the Kelly family. And, and I would just uh, like to we, say that I, I don't know whether Mrs. Kelly is aware of this, but of course she knows, Tricia knows that I had a chapter in my book called The Wrong Man about the terrible suffering that the family went through and that Brian, Brian who became my friend, went through. But what she may not realize is that, that the CIA leaned very heavily on me to leave that story out of my book. And I explained to um, the gentleman I knew well who, who was trying to influence me to leave the name out of the book that, that if he were a marginal uh, character, I might consider that. But he was central, you know, he, he was the wrong man. He was central to the story of the Robert Hansen and eventually Mike deserves full credit for uh, making it possible to arrest Robert Hansen. But um, that wasn't it. That wasn't the end of it because uh, then the director of the CIA, uh, George Tennant, wrote a letter to the president of Random House, which was my publisher, uh, saying what a terrible thing I was doing, uh, ruining this man's life. and. Uh, to. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I said to my publisher, the CIA uh, walked him out of the building, and as far as I know, they didn't challenge the FBI and say, well, where's the evidence on Brian Kelly? And to the credit of, of my publisher, they didn't even respond to George Tennant's letter. And when an assistant to the publisher said, well, aren't you going to answer the letter, he said, let him read it in the book. <laughs> And that's my kind of publisher. Well, one other comment before we leave this, okay? Because, uh, you know, one of the things that was really uh, amazing to me about Brian is uh, after all this is done, he stays with National Counterintelligence Executive and, and winds, winds up, uh, I think, as a contractor. And he winds up teaching the community in what does he take on. He, he, teaches the community how in unsub investigations you should not have an over reliance on conclusions by analysts misjudgments uh, that lead investigators away from gut instinct and into an over analyzed situation could misconnect the wrong dots okay I hope I'm saying it correctly and and uh, I know analysts in the bureau have taken that course and, uh, you know, taking it to heart. Um, and I know that that was some of the mantra that we used in CD4 of the espionage section, which I built uh, after that case uh, before I retired. So, you know, uh, it's a good legacy. It really is. Um, so. Thank you. A couple other questions. We're, we're going a few minutes over, but I think uh, we have a lot of questions here, so we'll try to get to as many as we can, gentlemen. Oh. Um, I'd like to ask about what you knew about Robert Hansen's wife and um, how much she might have known um, if she visits him today and if she does, why? And I'd like maybe the psychiatrist to ask, answer some of that if he knows. <laughs> um, maybe I, I can answer that a little Please, bit. Please, Dave. Um, yeah. um, Bonnie Hansen, obviously, as we've discussed this evening, she knew that he wasn't writing to a girlfriend, and she was quite relieved that he was only writing to the Russians. 
so obviously she was aware back in 79 when he was spying for the GRU that he was indeed a Russian spy. He promised her he would stop and uh, she apparently believed that. So then the question arises when he seemed to have more money than a uh, typical FBI special agent might have, whether she was curious about that. And there was the incident which I've described where uh, several thousand dollars was found on his dresser. And uh, his brother-in-law brought that to the attention of the FBI, but that never got to headquarters, apparently, his complaint about that. He, re he was out in Chicago and told his uh, told one of the people in his office about that money. And that was not considered apparently significant enough to get up to headquarters, as far as I know. Um, so um, I, I can't say to what extent she might have suspected or known. Um, she, uh, she says that it came as a complete shock to her. But, it, well, the word complete, you know, she remembered 1979. And apparently uh, she discovered he hadn't stopped after all. Um, so that's one of the mysteries that, uh, you know, it can't, not every question can be answered, not every mystery can be solved, and that would be in her mind, certainly, um, as, as to what she knew, when she knew, and the classic Washington question. But we do know that she knew in 79 that he was spying for the Russians, and beyond that, there's, there's no way to answer it. Do we know, David or Dr. Charney, uh, whether or not she continues to uh, visit her husband? They remain married, I suppose? Yes, yes, I can answer that. Uh, she does visit her husband. She has visited him in the Supermax, and uh, they are uh, still married, as far as I know. And um, um, I think she's supportive of her husband. And they have children, several children. And uh, you... Uh, you can't wipe away a whole marriage uh, and, and, and that whole family history because the, your husband is in the supermax. So, yes, and I think, I think she uh, feels some obligation to help him uh, see, see his ways at this point. I don't know. If, if, I suppose if, as an Opus Dei Catholic, she remains true to her marriage, uh, to life do us part. Uh, but still, she's got to deal with not only the spying, but the, the relationship with the stripper, the videotaping of their sexual uh, relations and sharing it with their best friend. Sounds like a, a difficult uh, uh, premise they, for a marriage. There, there were some problems. Challenging. There we all have some, our challenges, some I suppose. problems there. Uh, Joy. Okay, please. Oh, oh, sorry, thanks. Yes, Mr. Rosford, I'm very curious. Um, for all these analysts that put together this very elaborate matrix of evidence or of, of clues, I guess you'd say, to try to isolate access, why is it this entire matrix failed to point at any time to the FBI? Oh, so don't forget, um, one of the two or three key elements of a 62-point matrix was the KGB reorganized Directorate K, which was their headquarters component equivalent of the uh, Central Intelligence Center's Counterintelligence Center. And they reorganized it based on this source's information and some regular weekly meetings that uh, this person was able to get to them on, on about the early stages of CIC. So that, to us, tells us who would have access to that, not Hanson. It doesn't make sense to us, right? But, but again, did we misanalyze a piece of information and give it too much weight. And yeah, I think that's probably what we did. You know? So um, that that's that becomes uh, a, a big deal. Question over here, too. Um, to, if you can if you're able to say, um, one aspect of this that has just always fascinated me is this tunnel. Um, and if you're able to say, was the bureau 
ever able to assess sort of the counter damage that was done by having the tunnel. Not just that the, the, not just that the Russians knew that the tunnel was there, but information that sort of was, or disinformation that was fed back to the Bureau, and what damage that might have caused, and if so, how long it took to overcome that. You know, great question, but I'm not gonna talk about any of that. <laughs> As I said, if you could. <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I don't know anything about it. Okay. Please, sir. Good evening, very good presentation. My name is Pat O'Hanlon. I was a special agent with the U.S. Department of State for 30 years. Prior to that, a counterintelligence agent with the U.S. military. I have a question to ask. The FBI, I assume, does a routine update of investigations every five years. Nobody noticed that he was spending money. I mean, the neighbors said he bought cars, brand new cars, expensive ones. Nobody looked at that. I mean, there were telltale signs along the way. All right. So. Great questions, and I... Well, how about a great answer? Yeah, here, here's, <laughs> here's, here's what happens on those cases, okay? Um, I call them puffs of smoke that we should be looking at, uh, should be parking in a, in a file that would be good fodder for the background investigators and also for adjudication on whether or not to take clearances away. At that time, the bureaus... Uh, section for security we, was not a division, if I remember correctly, to become a division until after the uh, Hansen case. Um, they didn't put into place an internal referral system from the Office of Security under the 811 mandate. You know 811s are, they're, they're mandates after the Ames case. Uh, Congress, you know, I think it was Hipsy, decided uh, that the relationship between the FBI and the CIA was broken and that they, the agency was, according to the agent, uh, Hipsy, was not sharing with the Bureau on a timely basis its uh, suspicious feelings of anomalous activities of its employees that went to the heart of um, counterintelligence issues for internal investigations, thereby giving the Bureau a fair chance to find and detect and work with the victim agency, potential agency, early and often for uncovering a potential spy, okay? So they superimposed on the entire community after 94, the encumbrance that every member of the intelligence community will often and early communicate with the Bureau on these anomalous activities. Every uh, agency had to tell the Bureau this, the Bureau had to track them, and the Bureau had to tr give the responses to these kinds of referrals, 811 referrals, to HIPSI on numbers and, and agency reports to us every February. Okay, so guess what? The Bureau didn't adhere to that 811 system because they didn't look at it that way. After the Hansen case, now they set up an internal mechanism to have referrals from security to the Bureau, um, and they would track such things. I mean, that's never going to happen again. Look, you know, you learn the hard way, uh, and, and, and it's, it's a really good question, but, you know, the Bureau's got scars and culpability for, you know, kind of not looking harder inside and, and determine it was Hansen. Certainly, had we known that he was Xeroxing you know, uh, the Yurchenko debriefings in 1985, you know, with, when he was told not to. We might have done something to look at that Xerox machine and see if there's any other nefarious Xeroxing by him, but it was one of those forgiveness attitudes, kind of said, okay. And, and the other things that he was doing, we didn't track, so. Um, shame on us, you know, and, and we're better at it now. Mike, one thing that I was surprised to learn uh, is one, that neither the CIA at that time nor the FBI were examining packages that were being taken out by employees, by agents, and also that Robert Hansen in his entire career, until he was uh, caught, was never polygraphed once. And, that, and that was just shocking to me. That's true. Yeah. Right. So now every bureau agent, 
is polygraphed uh, upon employment and then is on a, uh, I think, a five year uh, um, scope for re polygraphs. I'd just like to, to point out that uh, about the difference between Ames and Hansen, Hansen was very frugal in spending his money. You might even say cheap. Uh, he didn't throw his money around. Uh, there's a big difference, and his car was not, uh, Mr. Hanlon, Han uh, was not an expensive car. Um, whereas Aldrich Ames drove a Jaguar every day into the CIA parking lot. No one, <laughs> no one, uh, no one raised an eyebrow about that. Um, and Ames bought his house, half a million dollar house, with cash. And no one seemed to be too concerned about that until a woman who'd worked with him, Diana Worthen, did bring it to the attention of the authority. So there was a big difference. Um, if you were looking for um, vulnerabilities or, you know, the di difference between he, how, how those two spies were spending their money it was very, very different. And uh, uh, Hansen was not a drunk. Ames was a drunk. So you can't always just look for vulnerabilities and find uh, and find your spy that way. I'm not in the business of finding spies. I leave that up to Mike, um, who's very good at it. But um, uh, there's there there's no uh, simple way to say, oh well, this fellow's drinking, so he's got to be a spy, um, or this fellow is uh, having an extramarital affair, so he's got to be a spy. Um, and so it's a very tough business. And, and, and when you just look at the money, it, uh, it wouldn't have helped very much in this case. Is there one final question? Let's end it right here. Hello, I'm Ron Sekinger. And like Alan back here, I served on the Hanson Damage Assessment Team. As part of that effort, I interviewed him twice in the Supermax in Colorado. Uh, like Dave Charney, I found that he was very voluble because he was in solitary, so any visitor at all was a real change of pace for him. He talked a lot. Uh, he certainly compartmentalized a lot, but the thing I want to mention is his ability to rationalize was just uh, breathtaking. Uh, he said, for example, um, in the course of hi human history, a little espionage doesn't amount to a hill of beans. He said, uh, um, well, I forgot, there were a couple of other things that, that was uh, also like that. But on the, on the damage assessment team, we, we concluded that the main impetus for his espionage was the thrill of being a James Bond, that it was mainly psychological, that needing money was kind of the trigger that started him down that role. But every day he could be at, at the FBI where, his, where the special agents treated him with contempt and he could always think, you don't know what I'm doing at night. Thank you for those comments, and um, we'll end it with that note. Um, the story we've heard here tonight is um, just a part of American law enforcement's history. Uh, when the National Law Enforcement Museum opens in the spring of 2016, uh, we'll be telling visitors about this story and many others. Uh, this was a fascinating discussion tonight, gentlemen. Uh, and I want to thank our panelists, retired FBI Special Agent Mike Rochford, and uh, renowned author David Wise for a, a very uh, interesting discussion. Thank you. I want to also remind you that uh, the book Spy that David has written uh, is available right outside uh, for sale if anyone would like to pick up a copy. We have a few on hand. Um, and his latest book, again, Tiger Trap, America's Secret Spy War with China, also a very interesting read. I want to thank our friends from Target uh, for sponsoring tonight's event. As always, thank you so much for your support. And Peter, uh, thank you and uh, the International Spy Museum for being uh, just wonderful hosts and great partners. We look forward to doing more with you. Yeah. I want to thank all who've joined us tonight. Dr. Charney, thanks for your contributions. Uh, Mrs. Kelly, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your story. Yes. And I want to thank our friends from C-SPAN for covering this event and, and the others that we've done in this series and for sharing this with uh, our national audience. Uh, this concludes tonight's program. 
Uh, please take this opportunity to visit with our panelists as you leave. And uh, thank you all very much, and good night.